Hello viewers, Waiting for Godot, written by Samuel Beckett, is an interesting play published in 1949 and it revolves around two characters who are waiting for someone who never comes. Waiting for Godot is an absurdist play that experiments with the themes of existential philosophy. The utter purposelessness and uncertainty of the plot causes the reader to wonder if it is possible to reach a meaningful conclusion in the play or in life. The play was originally written in French titled En Attendant Godot. Samuel Beckett originally wrote the play in French with the title En Attendant Godot. The work was innovative though it had some loose ends. The real plot distinct character development and adherence to dramatic traditions were not presented in a desirable format to the audience. The newness in the play made it popular and it became a cornerstone of theatre of the absurd, a dramatic body of work largely defined by the characteristic traits of Godot. After the play enjoyed its initial success, Beckett translated it into English. The play invited a lot of criticism which attacked literary merits and its value as philosophical work. In 1969, Beckett was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature for his revolutionary contribution to drama and literature. Samuel Beckett was born in Dublin in 1906. He was closely associated with Irish novelist James Joyce and his first published work was an essay on Joyce. In 1951 and 53, Beckett wrote his famous novels, The Trilogy Molly, Malon Dies and The Unnameable and his first play Waiting for Godot. It was premiered at a tiny theatre in Paris in 1953. This play began Beckett's association with the theatre of the absurd which impressed later playwrights like Harold Pinter and Tom Stoppard. The most famous of Beckett's subsequent plays include Endgame which was published in 1958 and Crap's Last tape which was published in 1959. He also wrote several even more experimental plays like Breath in 1969, a 32nd play. Beckett was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1969 and he died in 1989 in Paris. Waiting for Godot begins with two men waiting on a barren road by a leafless tree. These men, Latimer and Estragon, are often characterized as tramps. Latimer and Estragon are waiting for Godot, a man or perhaps a divine being. The tramps are uncertain about Godot. They are not sure if they are waiting in the right place on the right day or even whether Godot is going to appear at all. While they wait, Latimer and Estragon fill their time with a series of mundane activities. The tramps are soon disturbed by the arrival of Lucky, a man, a servant and a pet with a rope tied around his neck and Pozo, his master, holding the other end of the rope. The four men carry on to do together what Vladimir and Estragon did earlier by themselves, namely nothing. Lucky and Pozo leave the group so that Vladimir and Estragon can go back whiling away the time. Vladimir expresses his familiarity with Lucky and Pozo which is surprising since they acted as strangers upon arrival and Estragon also does not remember the conversation he had with them. The boy reports to Latimer that Godot is not coming today but will be there tomorrow. Estragon and Latimer 
also contemplate on committing suicide and then decide to leave the stage since it is night and resolve to continue with their wait the next day. Of course, having resolved to leave, neither man moves and the curtain closes on Act 1. In Act 2, the men are anxiously waiting for Godot and try to fill the leisure hours. Vladimir gets little philosophical in the meantime, wondering if maybe he is sleeping, agreeing with Pozo's claim that life is transitory and concluding that habit is the great leveler of life. Pozo and Lucky leave again and the boy repeats the same cue to Vladimir and Godot isn't coming today but will be there tomorrow. There is a repetition. Vladimir and Istragon contemplate suicide, but they do not have rope. The men resolve to leave since it's nightfall and they no longer have to wait for Godot. But neither man moves and the curtain falls. Let's look at different themes of this play. The first theme is theme of choices. Waiting for Godot consists of two men unable to act, move or think in any significant way while they kill time waiting for an anonymous man or divine creature called Godot. The characters are not smart enough to realize that waiting for Godot is not mandatory but an act of choice. They are poor decision makers and are unable to convert their thoughts into physical actions. Such inaction leads to stagnancy and repetition in the seemingly endless cycle of their lives. Second theme is theatre of the absurd. Waiting for Godot is appreciated as a classic example of theatre of the absurd. It's a dramatic work that supports the philosophy of its name. This particular play presents an ideal world which does not mean anything which includes different factors that is the language, mundane actions, time sense, wandering aloud etc. The third theme is theme of time. Time represents a swerve of problems in waiting for Godot. The title is self-explanatory and reveals its central action that is waiting. The two main characters are compelled to kill time while expecting the arrival of a man who never comes. For them, time is a frightful barrier and cyclical a test of their capability to tolerate. Time loses meaning when the actions of one day have no relevance or certainty on the next. The next theme is theme of religion. Religion is mismatched with reason in waiting for Godot. Characters are not competent enough to understand the logic of religion and the system is compared to such absurd realities banalities as switching bowler hats or taking a boot on and off. Religion is also tied to ambiguity since it is difficult to interpret truths and go deep into realm of faith. Next is theme of suffering. Suffering is the fundamental theme of waiting for Godot. Every character undergoes continuous suffering of all kinds, physical, mental and spiritual, with no seeming respite in sight. It compels some men to look for camaraderie to face the challenges of life and for some causes others to ill-treat their companions to reduce the suffering of the self and for still others are driven towards isolation. Next is theme of morality. The characters of Waiting for Godot know the fact that death is inevitable. They treat death casually and also contemplate suicide and consider it normal. 
they believe that there is nothing in their life worth worrying about. The characters do not commit suicide as they are not certain of anything in life and all their actions come to a standstill. Another important theme is or it reflects waiting, boredom, nihilism. As Beckett's title indicates that one of the most salient aspects of the play is that nothing really seems to progress. Ladimo and Estragon spend their time in the play waiting for Godot who never comes. Estragon is impatient to leave but Latimer wants to stay in case Godot shows up. Latimer and Estragon are bored to death because of their endless waiting. Both Latimer and Estragon repeat throughout the play that there is nothing to be done and nothing to do. The boredom of the characters on stage reflects the boredom of the audience. Beckett has deliberately constructed a play where not only his characters but also his audience waits for something that never happens. Just like Estragon and Ladimir, the audience also seems to wait anxiously for something unknown that never happens. All of this waiting for nothing, talking about nothing and doing nothing contributes to a insidious atmosphere of nihilism in the play. Broadly defined, nihilism is a denial of any significance or meaning in the world. Deriving from the Latin word for nothing, nihil, it is a universal view centered around exclusion claiming that there is no truth, morality, value or in an extreme form even reality. This appears to depict the world of the play which has a hollow meaning, emotion and substance leading to characters who prattle on endlessly in irrelevant conversation. Given the play's deep investigation of the absurd humor and feelings of hostility that arise from this nihilistic analysis of the world, one could conclude that waiting for Godot centers on nothing. Well, time is another important aspect. Beckett's conception of time has caught the attention of modernists and postmodernists alike. Perhaps the most significant aspect about time in the play is its uncertainty. All of the characters and thus the audience as well are certain or are uncertain of exactly when the play is taking place. The time period of the play is undecided as is the relative chronology of the play's events. Latimer is rather sure that act 2 is one day after act 1 but all the other characters oppose his views. Moreover, everyone except Vladimir seems to have forgotten the events of act 1 by the time act 2 begins. In act 2, Latimer and Estragon even differ over what time of day it is. In the middle of all this ambiguity, the one thing that seems definite is that time is recursive in waiting for Godot. That is, the same events repeatedly occur while characters also replicate themselves. As Pozo and Estragon forget their immediate past, they end up replicating much of Act 1 in Act 2. Vladimir and Estragon wait in the same place where the same two people, Lucky and Pozo, meet them and where a boy conveys the same communication from Godot. Vladimir himself wonders to what degree the events of Act 2 are an exact repetition of those in Act 1. 
as he asks whether Lucky and Pozo are the same characters from the previous day and whether it is the same young boy or a different one. The boy argues to be a different boy from that of Act 1 and Pozo does not remember Vladimir of Estragon but given all of the absent-mindedness in the play, Vladimir's questions remain unreciprocated. With this strangely cyclic sequential structure, the characters of Waiting for Godot are ensnared within an infinite present time. Time has stopped, says Vladimir in Act 1. Interestingly, the ending of the play seems somewhat illogical. It could have continued on for some more acts, which could be endless and recurring. As Vladimir and Estragon relentlessly wait for the appearance of the mysterious Mr. Godot, furthermore, it is ambiguous that the beginning of the play was really the beginning of this story. How many days did Astrogan and Vladimir come to the same part of the road and have essentially the same conversation before the day of act one is beyond the audience comprehension. Vladimir is one of the two main characters of the play. He is also addressed by Astrogan as Didi and the boy calls him Mr. Albert in a bizarre moment. He seems to be more dependable and mature of the two main characters. The play describes Vladimir as an intellectual. He is the alpha male with a sharp memory and he appears to be logical in his approach towards life. And Vladimir makes a point of saying, repeatedly we might add, that Easterkin depends on him for his life. His persistence and uh, that Estragon depends totally on him probably means that he is also equally dependable and needs Estragon just as much. They spend their maximum time asking if they should really be friends or if they would be better off without each other. And as audience expects in the play, they become indecisive and never arrive at any sort of conclusion. The temperament of their friendship is as ambiguous as all other aspects of the play. The only thing that is certain is their uncertainty. Too scared to part but too hesitant to have a true friendship, the men are always at crossroads, especially Vladimir. Vladimir is also called Didi or in one weird moment Albert. This is very clear when Estragon wants to talk about his private nightmares. Don't tell me, he yells, followed shortly by don't tell me and finally with slightly less emotional, you know, I can't bear that. And this exchange happens thrice in waiting for Godot. While Vladimir may be capable of comprehending suffering intellectually, he surely cannot handle it emotionally or practically and that is the reason why he cannot tolerate the pain and agony of other human hearts. It does not match with his conception of reality. He can't keep the idea of suffering conceptual if he has to watch it taking place in front of his eyes. Estragon, the second of the two main characters. Vladimir calls him Gogo. He is weak and helpless, always looking for Vladimir's shield. He suffers from poor memory as Vladimir has to repeat and remind him in the second act about the events of the previous night. Estragon is not actually a simpleton at all. He may not possess the intellectual fortitude, but he has this practice of making philosophical observations as though they were insignificant. More interesting than his prudence, however, it is his perception of the emotional significance of such an outcome. Vladimir cannot lead life in seclusion and he would embrace death to loneliness. In Act 2, 
he wowed us with the we are all born mad some remain so and he exhibits his own unique reasoning when he asks pozo if having gone blind he can now see into the future traits commonly linked in mythology but Eastergen completely enjoys the credit when he answers one of our biggest questions about waiting for Godot is why does he and Vladimir fill their time with silly activities and play acting? We always find something. Eastergen casually remarks in Act 2 to give us the impression we exist. Third character is Pozo. Pozo is dictatorial barbaric focused only on himself and seems to possess some sort of supernatural watch. He passes by the spot where Vladimir and Eastrigan are waiting and provides a diversion. In the second act he is blind and does not remember meeting Vladimir and Eastrigan the night before. But if Pozo has celestial powers it is certainly limited. His memory is flawed, his helpless, needs to be asked to sit down, can't rise to his feet without support and is dependent on the presence of others for any sort of function. For example, I cannot go long without the society of my likes, he says. He even credits Lucky with having taught him all he knows. Pozo may be a god. But if so, he is an imperfect one. Godot, very important character. Godot, as we talk about in his scrutiny, is an absent deity. Pozo too seems sort of like a god. He has complete control over Lucky. He tells the men the land is his, laughs at the thought that they are the same species as himself and even outrightly says that he is not particularly human. But if Pozo is a god, we have to bring together that with his being, what was it? Oh yes, tyrannical, cruel and focused only on himself. This is very strange kind of god than we imagine of say Godot. One popular learned belief is that Godot is a Christian god, is omniscient uninvolved and without human form or personality. Pozo, on the other hand, is like something out of Greek mythology. He has the same emotions as others have and has the same character flaws and is motivated by selfish concerns. The only difference between him and a mere mortal is his power. The boy who communicates. He presents himself at the end of each act to convey Vladimir that Godot will not appear that night. In the second act, he maintains that he was not there the previous night. Lucky is Pozo's slave who carries Pozo's bags and stool. In act 1, he entertains by dancing and thinking. However, in act 2, he is dumb. Let's get introduced to symbolism, imagery and allegory. Waiting for Godot is replete with religious allusions. Christianity dominates from the early stages in the play as Vladimir asks whether Eastrigan have read the Bible or not. The insignificant tree too can have multiple interpretations, but religious scholars love to see it as an image of the cross. Moreover, despite Beckett's refusal of any godliness in Godot, we thoroughly feel that the absent protagonist appears to be a messiah for the two tramps. Yet, another religious interpretation of waiting for Godot is encouraged by the connection of Lucky's idea of God with white beard and the boy's identical portrayal of Godot. The never ending wait also presents the basic biblical idea of Christ's return on the doomsday to put an end to all sufferings 
and the sufferings of Vladimir and Estragon. In fact, what helps Didi and Gogo sustain their existence amidst eternal emptiness is their faith that Godot will surely come tomorrow if not today and match with all the disorders. Once Gogo compared himself to Christ, it seems more than a distant twist of fate that he ironically mirrors the last few days of Christ. Estragon spent the night in a drain, so did Christ in a cave after his death or crucifixation. Also, having heard about Estragon being beaten up, Latimer reaches out to embrace him like loving Veronica. Also, Pozo examines the cuts on Estragon's leg as he wakes up, thus reenacting the Apostle's examination of Christ's wounds after his rising. The most imperative biblical reference in Samuel Beckett's play is, however, is the myth of crucifixation. Crucifixion is also explained through the tree. The tramps attempt to hang themselves from it. The skull in Lucky's speech and so forth. The tree can be interpreted in Act 2 as another symbol of crucifixion. Lathimer's feeding Estragon on carrot is reminiscent of Jesus feeding a crowd of 5,000 on meager foods. The tree for Estragon seems more like a bush, thus invoking Exodus picture of Moses on Mount Sinai. These references are in fact incoherent, but in general, the tone they create excites the recipient more and more into a religious elucidation. To conclude, the play has got a philosophical tone which we readers need to understand through in-depth analysis. Hope you have got the message. Thank you.